last time on Ear Witness. She was a very credible witness. We believed her. Obviously, we believed her because we convicted him, and it was on her testimony. The only evidence, supposedly, they had against him was this ear witness who had never heard him speak before, who had no idea who he was. That is extremely strong evidence if it's believed. Of course, the question becomes, do you believe that evidence? Well, to believe that evidence, you have to believe Ms. Ellison. And so we're trying to get information on her. Her name's Violet Ellison. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion about her or have any, any information that you could give us about her? I know she's very vindictive. She's a very messy lady. Very messy. But I can tell you one thing about my grandma. She is a, that's a true scam artist. That's a true, I hate to say it, I know that's my grandma, but that's a true scam artist. Though. And I hate that this man <laughs> could be innocent and for $5,000. He's on death row for $5,000. Near the intersection of Rosa Parks Avenue and Liberty Street in Montgomery, Alabama, is a tiny red brick church. Outside St. Peter AME, a large white banner is stretched 25 feet across the church's front lawn. The words, it's not too late to fix this mistake, are written across the banner in black and red letters. The mistake is to Forrest Johnson's conviction. The banner was created by an organization called Greater Birmingham Ministries. This year, it has traveled to eight different churches across Alabama to help raise awareness about DeForest's case. Awareness that is growing. Holy cow! It's just ridiculous. This case is shameful. My name is Lindsay Boney. I'm a lawyer at the law firm Bradley Arant Bolt Cummings. When I think about this case, it's mind-blowing to me. My name is Carla Crowder. I'm a lawyer and executive director at Alabama Appleseed Center for Law and Justice. This case is stunning, and this case is heartbreaking. My name is Nick Gady. I have been an active lawyer in Birmingham since 1964. We can do better, and we need to do better. Lots of people have known for a very long time that this man is innocent and he's still on death row. Why does it take 25 years? These are just a few in the chorus of powerful voices calling on the state to fix this. Lawyers from all sides of the political spectrum are lending their support, along with former prosecutors and judges, as well as Alabama churches and faith leaders, like Sister Helen Prejean. Please, God, with these efforts and people hearing this about to Forrest, his life will be saved. Even death penalty supporter Bill Baxley, Alabama's former attorney general, has joined the fight. I will add my voice or anything I can do because this is a situation that uh, shouldn't be allowed to exist another minute. When Baxley reviewed Tafora's case, he was so outraged, he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post that said an innocent man is trapped on Alabama's death row. The only thing that, that I can see as to why this kind of thing happened was the victim was a law enforcement officer. DeForest Johnson now has unprecedented support. And it's not just from all these people who believe he's innocent. The current district attorney of Jefferson County, along with 
the original prosecutor who sent him to death row, both now say to Forrest Johnson deserves a new trial. So why is the state of Alabama still trying to kill him? I'm Beth Shelburne. This is Ear Witness. Chapter 8, Bondage to the Law. Hey, what's going on? How are you? I'm all right. You doing okay? I'm good, yeah. Good. Good to see you. I'm meeting with District Attorney Danny Carr, but not at his office in the courthouse. We're at the barber shop he owns in Birmingham's Inslee community, where he grew up. I'm from the Inslee community where we are today. Um, I matriculated through the Birmingham City School System. The barber shop is old school, tile floors, posters of hairstyles on the walls, and a sign advertising $10 haircuts. Can you talk while he's buzzing? Oh, yeah. I don't normally interview prosecutors while they're getting a haircut, but Danny Carr is a busy man. In 2018, when he was elected district attorney of Jefferson County, he became the first black man to hold the position. He now runs the same office that argued for Taforest Johnson to be sentenced to death for Deputy Bill Hardy's murder. But Danny Carr wasn't part of Taforest's prosecution. He wasn't even a lawyer yet when it happened. Danny Carr is different from other DAs in a number of ways. He ran as a change maker he put together the first conviction review unit in Jefferson County. The unit's job is to review cases where the DA's office might have made some mistakes. He's one of only three black DAs among the 42 across Alabama. He grew up in a community that's been impacted by crime and mass incarceration. His family has also been a victim of violence. The year he was hired as a young prosecutor, Danny's younger brother, Jackson, was murdered. Danny named his barber shop D and J in his brother's memory. D for Danny, J for Jackson. Can you kind of walk me through your involvement in the Taforest Johnson case? When did you first become aware of it? Um, I became aware of it um, when I was an assistant DA. Conversations about it. But um, I didn't know truly the facts of it. I just overheard different conversations, varying opinions about it. And then what happened... Once Danny was elected as DA, he started hearing more about DeForest's case as a possible wrongful conviction. And the year after Danny was elected, DeForest's case was back in court. This was the hearing I covered the first time I reported on DeForest's case, where his attorneys argued that Violet Ellison testified in pursuit of the reward money, and the state hid it. I saw Danny Carr at the hearing, but he told me he wasn't ready yet to comment on the case. I didn't know, you know, who was telling the truth, who, what was right, what was wrong. I just listened. And um, it was apparent that if some of that stuff was true, then it was concerning. So after the hearing, Danny decided to conduct a full review of Taforest's conviction. For nine months, he read through the trial transcripts, as well as the documents that prosecutors had claimed were misfiled. He was troubled by the $5,000 reward payment given to Violet Ellison that the jury didn't even know was a possibility. Well, if that information was not disclosed, then the process was flawed. And if the process was flawed, then the end result is not truly the end result. Because to get to that end result, the process has to be fair. 
Danny also talked to people involved, including alibi witnesses. But perhaps the most significant person Danny Carr consulted, the original prosecutor, Jeff Wallace, the same prosecutor who asked two juries to sentence to Forrest to death. It turns out Jeff Wallace had his own questions about the credibility of his star witness, Violet Ellison, going back 15 years. I observed something that triggered in my mind the need to report this to the defense. I don't know if you know about that or not. What, what did you observe? After the conviction and sentence of... Several years after Teforest was convicted, Jeff said he was passing through a courtroom during a trial of a drug dealer. Jeff Wallace wasn't prosecuting the case. He just needed to ask the bailiff a question. And as I left the bailiff station, which of course is in the front of the courtroom, I'm walking out and happened to notice in the uh, spectators area on the front row, the defendant's wife being consoled by our chief witness in the Johnson case. In my Violet Ellison. Ms. Ellison, that's right. In my mind, that conduct was inconsistent with the picture that I had of Miss Ellison at the time of trial. She seemed to me to be only a mother trying to do the best thing for her daughter and happened to overhear a telephone conversation uh, and that uh, record that uh, the notes that she made of that telephone conversation became important in the trial of Mr. Johnson, as you know. Uh, so her credibility as the citizen she was, I think was important because she was the case. She is the case. To be clear, I'm not sure what consoling a suspected drug dealer's wife has to do with Violet Ellison's credibility in Forrest's case. But Jeff said it left him with an unsettling impression about his star witness, a realization that there were things about her he didn't know. So seeing her uh, being so close to the wife of a man that everybody knew was a major drug dealer uh, disturbed that image in my mind. I thought, well, I'm going to report that to the other side, to the defense. And he did. In 2007, Jeff Wallace talked to Teforest's legal team about what he saw. They looked into the information, but so far it hasn't led to any new legal claims for Teforest. Fast forward 13 years, and Danny Carr calls on Jeff Wallace to talk about the conviction of Teforest Johnson. Jeff shares his concerns about Violet Ellison's credibility, and then he does something that makes a major impression on Danny. Jeff Wallace says he believes Teforest should be granted a new trial. This incredible development pushes Danny to take public action. Your job is not to get convictions. Your job is to seek the truth. But Danny has one more important call to make to Deputy Bill Hardy's family. He braces himself. It's never easy for a prosecutor to talk to a victim's family about unsettling the conviction and their loved one's murder. But he picks up the phone and calls Deputy Hardy's widow, Patricia Diane Hardy. You know, and I called her, she said, look, she said, I know your mom, I know you, I've been knowing you since you was a little boy. She said, you know, I trust you, and whatever decision you make, I'm fine with it, but I trust you. And uh, you can't get any better than oh, that. Yeah. And that's what you want from people, period. And then Danny Carr does something extraordinary, something that almost never happens. He files a brief with the Jefferson County Court, writing that his duty to seek justice requires intervention in the case of Teforest Johnson. He asks Judge Pulliam to throw out Teforest's conviction and order a new trial, and he includes that the original prosecutor, 
Jeff Wallace, supports this call for a new trial. Of all the capital murder cases that you've looked at, you've tried, you've um, been familiar with as DA, how does how do you see this case? How would you describe it in the context of, of all the cases you've seen? Um, I think it's the worst case. I spoke with Jeff Wallace about his support for a new trial. I think you uh, joining the district attorney is a powerful statement um, from a former prosecutor in a capital case. I can't remember in my reporting of over 20 years um, ever seeing that or hearing about it. Oh, I'm sure I'm not the first. Jeff seemed to want to downplay the significance of his support for a new trial. But this is seriously rare. I looked for other cases like this and reached out to experts who study wrongful convictions. Nobody could remember a death penalty case in any state where the original trial prosecutor called for a new trial. I interviewed Jeff Wallace three different times with four hours of on-the-record conversations. Jeff was accessible and generous with his time, but he was also careful with his words. I still am personally satisfied that the evidence showed DeForest Johnson to be guilty. Of course, my uh, opinion is based in large part on the testimony of the Violet Ellison that I saw at trial. Mm -hmm. But there's a, in my opinion, there's a reason to look at it again. This is what I mean by careful. He says the evidence at trial showed DeForest to be guilty based on Violet Ellison's testimony. But he also says the concern he had about Violet Ellison's credibility is why he supports the call for a new trial. After my first conversation with Jeff Wallace in 2021, I did a lot more investigating into Violet Ellison. I asked to speak with Jeff again because I wanted to share everything that I learned. We also found that... um, In addition to being a witness in this case, Violet Ellison has been a witness in four other criminal cases um, in Jefferson County. After the Johnson case? Uh, Before, during, and after. Um, I tell Jeff about the other cases where Violet Ellison was a witness for the state and that the defense accused her of lying to police and under oath. He listens politely. But what I really want is for Jeff Wallace to hear some clips of what people are saying about Violet Ellison, the star witness he put on the stand, the same witness he now has questions about. Do you um, have any interest in, in listening to what we found? No. You don't? I, I find that, like, astonishing. I don't know. Can you please, can you explain why you don't want to hear what we found? I'm not the prosecuting attorney in the case. Or, for that matter, the defending attorney. Of course, I couldn't be, be, but... uh, Yeah, but Jeff, I mean, you tried this case, and you asked the jury to sentence him to death, and he's on death row. That was the state of the evidence when I was standing in the courtroom. The evidence hasn't changed in your mind after what we've told you? No, I think the evidence has changed, but it's no longer my responsibility. In a way, he's right. The responsibility of all death row cases after conviction falls to Alabama's attorney general, an elected position that represents the entire state, unlike district attorneys, who represent a single county. The current attorney general in Alabama is Steve Marshall. He could listen to Danny Carr and Jeff Wallace and allow a new trial for DeForest Johnson. But instead, the AG's office calls this a subjective opinion that does not raise an issue of extraordinary public importance or any compelling circumstances. Marshall's office is still actively and aggressively fighting to Forrest's appeals, 
and seeking his execution. These conflicting positions make me think of those big metal grain silos that you see in the Midwest, with each party in our criminal justice system in its own silo, isolated from the opposing view, trapped in their official position. I talk with Jeff Wallace about this dynamic. It does seem like um, there are a lot of silos that people are in, in the system, and um, they stay in those silos. Does that make sense? It does. Um, And if a silo is a thing that you cannot climb out of, then that's where I am. I've told you what I think. If it were legal and it were presented to me, uh, would you or would you not order a new trial, Mr. Wallace? I would sign it today and order a new trial. But the thing you're calling a silo, my silo is a retired former prosecutor who happened to have been in charge of this case at one time. So why can't you climb out of the silo? What silo would I climb into? I can't be an appellate judge. I can't be the defendant's attorney. I can't be a juror. I can't be the defendant. What if we just all (laughs) climb out of our silos and nobody's in a silo anymore? If we're all just kind of out in the open? Well, the law has set up these silos and the law is still in effect. Yeah, there's this quote on the outside of the Jefferson County Courthouse that... We are in bondage to the law in order that we may be free. That's it. We are in bondage to the law in order that we may be free. It's a quote from Roman philosopher Cicero. Why do we have to be in bondage to something to be free? Either we have laws or we don't. Which way do you want it? I guess one thing that we've been thinking about is like, what is the cost of that bondage? And is it that sometimes you end up with situations like this? I sure hope not. But the law is the law. No one is going to present me that piece of paper and ask me whether I would order a new trial. I'm in bondage to the law. You may see Jeff Wallace's support for a new trial as a half measure. He could call the case an injustice and take more accountability for his role into Forrest's conviction. But a trial prosecutor saying anything that calls a conviction into question is exceptional. There's no incentive for Jeff Wallace to say a word, no framework for prosecutors to voice doubt or space for regrets to count. And yet, Jeff Wallace still chose to speak up when he didn't have to say anything at all. In this project, we tried to answer the question of how an innocent man ended up on death row. We laid bare an investigation that was rushed to conclusion by tunnel vision and pressure to convict someone, anyone, for the murder of a deputy sheriff. This case shows us how young, marginalized people like Yolanda Chambers can be exploited and how money is wielded as an incentive for vulnerable people to become ensnared with law enforcement. It also demonstrates the terrible consequences for people who can't afford to pay for the best criminal defense. So far, the courts have said there was nothing illegal about what the state did, presenting five different theories about who committed the murder and paying the key witness behind closed doors only admitting to this payment 17 years later. This is how our system works. According to the courts that have examined DeForest Johnson's conviction, it's not broken. It's working exactly as designed. Yeah. 
they say that you presumed innocent until proven guilty, and that is the law. Former Attorney General Bill Baxley. But uh, deep down, uh, people don't believe somebody's innocent uh, until they're proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt. They think that uh, they had to do something or they wouldn't have been arrested and wouldn't have been indicted and wouldn't be there. Not only do they presume people guilty, but they look at these people as expendable. Richard Jaffe, who represented Ardragus Ford. When the system failed to Forrest Johnson, it betrayed all of us. Tavares Johnson is as innocent as anyone could possibly be. Deputy Hardy would never want the wrong person to be convicted for his murder. After Jaffe's client, Ardragus Ford, was acquitted, he lived a quiet life, mostly in Atlanta. His mother, Joyce Ford, said to Forrest's conviction weighed on her son. He never talked about it. He was strong. He never talked about it. But, you know, you know, he would get quiet at times. He would be rolling in a wheelchair, He'd go sit quiet with his head down. You know, it, it took him a while to try to overcome it. You never overcome it, but so, you know, he had his days. You know, through it all, through the grace of God, it took, it was a long, hard battle, but I would never wish that on a mother. Ardragus died from health issues in 2021. His mom, Joyce Ford, died less than a year after we recorded this interview. I've been reporting on Forrest's case since 2019. I've interviewed dozens of people, but the one person I'd still most like to talk to is the very person I can't reach. Alabama's prison system doesn't allow people on death row to talk to journalists. Forrest's family has shared dozens of digital photos with me that I've kept in a folder on my laptop. There's Forrest as a baby wearing a tiny suit, as a skinny kid wearing a bow tie, and so many photos from visits at Holman Prison with his arms around his family. And I know the closest I can get to him is through the people he loves the most, his kids. writing about your dad's case for about two years now. So um, I'm so happy to finally see y'all and meet y'all and get to hang out with you, especially in In October of 2021, I asked to Forrest's kids if we could all get together and talk. So we meet up on a Saturday afternoon at his oldest daughter, Shanae Poole's place. It's a light-filled condo in downtown Birmingham. Her golden doodle, named Banks, meanders around, wagging his tail at everyone. And his kids immediately start to share memories of their dad. I remember going and realizing how short he was, though. <laughs> He's so short when we took a picture on side of each other. Yes. He's I so short. Y'all, Maurice. You, yeah. so, you like tower over daddy. And I'm his, I'm his same height. Um, I'm Shanae Poole. I am the oldest daughter of Tafarist. Shanae has his smile. Uh, I'm Maurice Myers, and I'm the fourth oldest of the bars. His son, Maurice Myers, has his eyes and nose. Well, I'm Tremaine Perry. I'm the oldest cub. (laughs) (laughs) 
His oldest child, Tremaine Perry, has his voice and laugh. And I'm Akiria Lala, and I'm the baby cub. And Akiria, who goes by Muffin, his youngest, looks like she could be a twin to Teforest in his younger years. Teforest has one other son named Robbie Foster, but he was unable to join us for this gathering because he was living in Colorado at the time. He also looks like his father's twin. An inside joke is these siblings all share a common attribute from their dad. My head, man, we all got these big heads, if you haven't noticed. It's the forehead. That, that's what's really big, it's the forehead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He blessed us all with that. That's why I grew my hair. So I know I was the oldest, so I saw maybe a lot more than they did, you know what I mean? But it, I knew what was going on like when I stopped seeing them, you know what I'm saying? Because they told me like right off the bat. So how old were you when he... Probably about six or seven. Okay. This is Tremaine, the oldest cub. I was getting ready to, um, to ask my mom to take me to my pop's house. Like, I want to go, I want to go with my daddy this weekend. And she's like, you won't be able to go this weekend because you won't, he's not going to be there. So I'm like, what you mean? Well, yeah, I wait on him to come back. She's like, no, it might be a minute before he come back. And that's when I ended up calling my grandma. And she just let me know what was going on just right then. And that like, that kid kind of killed my spirits, you know what I'm saying? I don't, I'm thinking like, if he ain't did nothing wrong, then why he gone? I could never get an answer for that. Nobody could ever answer that, you know what I'm saying? So just knowing that this man is sitting behind bars 20 plus years for something that he didn't do, like that's heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, you ought to think, you, you think about how life would be if it hadn't happened, if things could be reversed. You, you think about a lot of stuff, but you can never get that, you know what I'm saying? Shanae also remembers trying to put the pieces together about why she had to go to the prison to see her dad. So I'm home with my mom and then I go visit my dad, but I didn't realize that that wasn't normal until we get into grade school and I see children with their two parents home. And so now I'm like, okay, this is something is not, this is not adding up, something is not right. So, you know, help me understand what's happening. And then it's like, okay, well, he's away, but he's innocent. So what does innocent mean? I'm a a kid, I don't understand what that means. He's there for something that he didn't do. Okay, well why can't he just come home then? And so then I begin to get frustrated with him because I'm like, okay, well if you didn't do it, then you could just come home. But clearly it doesn't work that way. And then as I got older- Even though their father wasn't at home, DeForest's kids didn't stop seeing him. They would get in the car with their grandmother, Donna, DeForest's mother, to make the 210-mile drive from Birmingham to Holman Prison three hours each way. <laughs> I just remember Ooh, always riding mm, that long ride. That is, oh my. <laughs> and I was so young, and I was like, oh my, this is it's the about longest a, car ride. It's almost like you're driving to Florida going down there. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's no, really no road like to lead to anywhere out there. I was like, uh, Yeah, we, we took those trips. In Alabama, visits with men on death row are done in the visiting yard, the same area DeForest met with his attorney, Ty. It's called the yard, but it's indoors, like a big cafeteria lined with vending machines. And of course, Grandma. So what I remember is quarters. Grandma used to have a sack. Yeah. Oh, my God. A sack of quarters. The freezer bags you used. Yeah, the the Ziploc, Ziploc We had those full of quarters and nickels. All the change we can get. (laughs) But before they got into the prison to see their dad, with the big bag of quarters so everyone could get their favorite snacks and candy from the prison yard vending machines, to Forrest's kids had to go through prison security, where guards searched them and patted them down. 
look at thinking back on a muffin i didn't really think about this until now just kind of how viol violating it kind of was you with them because right? they had to search us like yeah. the same way very violent yeah. i was like i didn't even want to go like back you finna go yeah in. and we were children basically touching all over you and i was just like yeah oh, this is a little weird i'm not comfortable with you touching me i mean i'm just a kid i'm not bringing nothing in here so it was just real violating i was like I really don't want to come back, but I want to so I can see my dad. I just don't want you to touch me. But And we couldn't, you know, touch him whenever we were in there. So, of course, you know, you want to sit on your dad's lap. You want to lay on him and hug on him, and you can't do that. You have to keep your distance from each other. And like Tremaine said, there's never enough time. It always seems like it's just, we just got here. And you got to turn back around and get on the road trip again. The visits were just a few hours once a month at most. But it's where and how they got to know their father. Their relationships with their father are marked by both his absence and his presence. They admire his strength, the way he loves to hear about their lives when they talk on the phone, and how he never makes them feel like their problems are small. When he calls you and you just want to talk about the good things, mm -hmm. and he's lived the, this life too, so he's all right, so now what's really going on? Like, I can hear it in your voice. Okay, princess, yeah. I'm not right. And I never like to tell him anything bad because he's just, he's, there's nothing that he could do, but he's like, you, this is my way of being a father to you. This is how I can parent you, so allow yeah. me to do that. And then you feel so much better after you talk to him about it. Yes. Because he's going to make you laugh. Oh, he's going to make you laugh. He's going to make you laugh. he keep you laughing. I'll be like, okay, I'm not mad anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And then it's hard to be mad. You know, it is hard to be angry or mad or kind of self sulk because. And you think about his situation. Right. Yeah. And he always asks, so what'd you eat? I never want to tell him what I ate for dinner. Never. Because yeah. <laughs> it's just. I, I don't either. I because hate telling him. I know him. he can't eat the same, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But he wants to know what you ate. He yeah, wants yeah. to know, or he wants like what we did today. Like if he would be, yeah. if he would be on the phone with Tremaine and Maurice, he'd be like, yeah, I talked to uh, Tremaine and Maurice uh, the other day and they were out somewhere, but he won't say they were, he'd be like, we were. Yeah. So like he's living through my brothers, like whatever right. they yes. do, he thinks like he's, he's out with them. them. Yeah. We're human bodies, like we have been affected. These are men that missed out on their father raising them. He's, he's missed the birth of multiple grandchildren. He's missed milestones, us completing college and getting our first big girl jobs and purchasing our first homes. Like These are really important things that he has missed out on. And so you have space and you have time between all of us that we literally cannot get back. Like There's nothing that we could do about it. Um, and so at the least that you could do is um, take, uh, be accountable for what was done. And I think that that's all we're asking for. At this point, we're not trying to point the finger at anybody. We just, we want true justice to be served and we just want him to come home and for there to be some type of accountability held. Um, and it's frustrating, it's disheartening, but it's like, well, we just gotta keep fighting because we gotta fight for daddy, we gotta fight to get daddy home. I think we've bypassed the point of pointing the finger and, you know, we're still hurting, we're still angry, we're still confused, upset, we have a lot of emotions, but we just want him to come home. Why is Forest Johnson still on Alabama's death row? Why is he still locked in a cell when so many people, including the prosecutor who argued to put him there, are calling for a new trial? In early October 2023, the United States Supreme Court announced it would not review Forest Johnson's case. But Forest's legal team continues to fight for him. They have appeals pending in both state and federal courts. This is where we find ourselves, unable to tell you how this story ends. I plan to stay here with Forest, his family, his children, his lawyers, and everyone else who believes in him. 
will continue to hold him in the light of truth. This is a free call from... The forest, yes. An incarcerated individual at Alabama Department of Corrections. This call is not private. It will be recorded and may be monitored. You may start the conversation now. Hey, Daddy. Hey, Princess. Hi. What you doing? I'm good. How was your day? It was good. Long today. Still trying to get used to... DeForest calls his family from prison whenever he can, but his oldest daughter, Shanae, also keeps his cards and letters in a K-Swiss shoebox under her bed. If I had to describe this card, there is a beehive on the front with a few bees buzzing around, and it's dated January the 5th, 2003. Like all the people who love to Forrest Johnson, his five kids and 15 grandkids, his mother Donna, his aunts, uncles, and cousins, they read the words he sent them over the years when they need to hold him close. It reads, I love you and can't wait to see you and hold you in my arms again. You, underlined, are the reason Daddy has a spirit to get up every day and has hope that there will be a better day up ahead for me. And he says, Shanae, Daddy wants you to be a good young lady and do what your mother asks of you. I love you and I hope to see you again real soon. Be good, all right? To learn more about the fight to free to Forrest Johnson, sign up for updates and learn how you can help. Visit the website created by Greater Birmingham Ministries for to Forrest. It's toforestjohnson.com. And a special thanks to the family of to Forrest Johnson, who have generously shared so much for this series. Ear Witness is a production of Lava for Good Podcasts in association with Signal Company No. 1. Executive producers are Jason Flom, Jeff Kempler, Kevin Wardus, and me, Beth Shelburne. The investigative reporting for this series was done by me and Mara McNamara. Producers are Mara McNamara, Hannah Beal, and Jackie Polly. Kara Kornhaber is our senior producer. Britt Spangler is our sound designer. Additional story editing from Marie Sutton. Fact check help from Katherine Newhan. And special thanks to DeForest Johnson's legal defense team. You can follow the show on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter at Lava for Good. To see behind the scenes content from our investigation, visit lavaforgood.com slash earwitness.